Leroye. Welcome to the Mind of Row page. I am Faju Junde Aguna Salamio. Today I'm making a video on my personal experience being marked my personal Kumbanda spirits. The last video I made was on colors. So basically I made a video on how colors affect our psyche. So the whole universe is made of colors, obviously. So a lot of us don't realize how much colors affect our feelings, our emotions, our, our the, way, the way we think and the way we behave. So if you like that kind of stuff and you want to know a little more information on how colors affect your well-being, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel at Mind of Row. I also have a TikTok, an Instagram, and a Twitter at Mind of Row, and a Snapchat at Little Little Row Row 253. I also have a Facebook business page at The Mind of Row. And I also do readings. So if you would like to get a reading, what I mean by reading is a psychic reading. I also, and an Ianifa, uh, so I do Ifa readings. So if you would like a reading, go ahead and shoot a comment or message me and let me know. And we will do a reading over video chat online from my Facebook page. So before I get started, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Quimbanda, so Quimbanda is an Afro-Brazilian religion typically associated with magic rituals with Eshu and Pampa Jira spirits. So before I really get into it, I'm sure and some of you might already know who Eshu is, but if you're watching this and you're not sure, Eshu is a considered a trickster god that is pro that is also a protective warrior to his practitioners and is considered a messenger between heaven and earth and also a messenger between all forces of nature as in a messenger between all the gods and goddesses and energies amongst the whole entire universe as we know it so pampa jira is the consort, or in other words, the wife, or a f female aspect of Eshu, or you could say she's his girlfriend, or wife, or queen to, whatever you want to call it. She is basically the female aspect of Eshu, who is also a messenger of the Orishas, and she is known with many, many names, and many, many avatars. And so is Eshu, but Pompajura is known as having much more aspects popular popular according to popularity she's known to have different names that she's associated with according to the pantheon of quimbanda she is associated with quimbanda so i don't know if you know this but back in the day pre-colonialism eshu was also associated with being a female as well until colonialism and patriarchal patriarchal kind of started and stuff like that and eventually now he's just seen as a male but the female aspect of Eshu has lived through the pantheon Kumbanda where we call her Pampa Jira who has the exact same powers the exact same force of nature aspects in the universe as Eshu does but before I get started of course I have to greet my Pampa Jira and Eshu because I love to talk about my Eshu and Pampa Jira when I first got initiated into them that's all I could do is, is talk about them they are beautiful wonderful beings they have a lot of bad rap about them so hopefully today I clear up some of these negative aspects and um um I think, not, I don't want to say lies, but misconceptions of who Pampa Jira is that's going on virally around the internet. It seems to be that Pampa Jira is getting really popular these days and she's kind of being turned into something she's not or less than an issue spirit. And I would like to hopefully be that one person, especially in the United States, to correct that miscommunication. Communication, hence the goddess of communication. Salve, povo da Pompeja Rosa Cavera. And I say Rosa Cavera because that is my Pompejura. That's a good way to greet them. Salve, povo da.
Salve povo da Eshu Tata Cavera, Eshu Tata Cavera. Because these are the ones that walk with me today and has always walked with me my whole life. I'm just now realizing it recently because they always do. If you have an Eshu and a Papa Jura with you, they have been with you your whole life. You just didn't realize it until you were initiated or associated in this type of path work. So Eshu and Pampajira in Kumbanda are associated with the number seven and the colors black and red. And in some leagues in Kumbanda are also associated with the color yellow as well. If you're associated with Kemeticism, a lot of crossroad deities in Kemeticism are associated with yellow or gold as well. So it doesn't surprise me that Eshu and Pampajira in some leagues in Kumbanda are associated with black and yellow as well because it is considered a crossroad or doorkeeper color not only in this path pantheon but other pantheons as well they are associated with the crossroads or in other words as known as the people of the street which a lot of people in Kumbanda greet them as the people of the street so first of all before i get started I want to talk about my personal experience being marked these spirits, but I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, what does it mean to be marked? I didn't literally, literally get marked. Um, there are certain pantheons like Paulo, for example, where people get um, scratched into the, the, their path or their priesthood. I did not get scratched. Marked is different. Basically, a marking is when you go get a reading done by a torero so a torero is the name of a priest in Kwambanda to find out if this is your path or not and then once you get a reading done you get another reading done to get marked your eshu and your pampajura basically what that means is it comes with with Kwambanda there's multiple versions of eshu and those multiple versions of pampajura like i said earlier avatars of them basically characteristics and different characters different ways they man manifest their self to us is basically what i'm saying same force of nature but different characteristics different needs and wants and kind of the same but different goals and roads or um, purposes within the universe that that they have is basically what i'm saying so what it means to get marked is you get a reading done and they will let you know if it is your path, if you have an Eshu and Pampajira walking with you, they will mark your spirit as and let you know, okay, Eshu and Pampajira has spoken and they said, yes, this is your path. And they say, yes, this is your Eshu that walks with you and this is your Pampajira that walks with you. And once you get that reading done, basically what it does is not only tell you who you are marked with, but it's also a soul agreement to allow them to know, hey, so-and-so is aware that you walk with them and so-and-so is now open to working with you. So it's a soul contract saying, hey, we're working together, basically is what it is. So once you get marked, they tend to come around more. They tend to communicate with you more and teach you about your not only yourself, but them, the, the path you walk, the practice, and stuff like that. So my personal Eshu and Pampajira are Eshu Tata Kaveda to not be confused with Eshu Kaveda. There is a Eshu who is called Eshu Kaveda and there is an Eshu called Eshu Tata Kaveda. My Eshu is Eshu Tata Kaveda and my Pampajira is Rosa Kaveda. So Tata Kaveda is what we call, when you get initiated, we call them our king and queen. So Tata is my king and Rosa is my queen. So when you first get marked, they'll let you know. I know I'm not going to give any, any, any secrets or anything like that of, of, of the process of everything, okay? So when I get marked, I also get told what I'm supposed to offer my spirits and how I'm supposed to invoke them and how I'm supposed to work with my specific spirits. I will not be sharing that information in this video because that is secret to the priesthood. If you would like to know that kind of information, Please let me know and I will forward you to a Torero and I will let you um, set that appointment up with him so you can learn that kind of stuff for yourself, okay? So I, if you are looking for those kind of secrets, I am not going to share those secrets in this video. I'm just going to share my personal experience and the steps you need to take if you decide to get marked, if you decide that this is your path, okay? 
So my issue is Tata Cavera and my female is Rosa Cavera. And they have one that walks in front of you and one that walks behind you. So Tata Cavera, if you were to look him up, he is associated or depicted as appearing as a grim reaper. He is typically has a skull face. So in Portuguese, Cavera means skull. So Tata means father and Rosa means rose and Cavera skull. So Tata Cavera is associated with a skull face and he tends to appear with a black cloak on. He's also typical to appear a lot like the loa if you're uh, if you're associated with vodun or voodoo work there are the loa for example the barons who associate who are also associated with skull faces who typically manifest herself with black suits and black top hats on tata Cavera is also known to be t depicted with the similar look. He can manifest himself and communicate with people with a similar look because they come out of the same dimensional frequency. As in any fall, we call that Odu. So he comes out of the same Odu or as in the same dimension or dimensional doorway as the Loa or even as Babaluaye or in Kwambanda, we call him Omolu, who comes out of a doorway in Odu that is the similar doorway they come out of. I'm not going to say that doorway now because I don't want to open any doorways, but they come out of that same dimensional field. We could call them Saturnian beings because they're associated with the energy of Saturn. Please, for those of you who like to do a lot of Google searching and want to be part of the woke group, please do not demonize the concept of Saturnian beings. That is a new age thing that came from ignorance. Please do your homework and understand it is not an evil concept. These beings are forces of nature that existed way before our time and they are very smart they are very needed in this universe okay so for those of you who are watching this and like to demonize saturnian beings please stop right now and please stop following fads because they don't know what they're talking about okay and especially since i am marked with these beings i know from personal experience and learning from them they people who kind of try to call them evil and all that kind of stuff is basically colonialism and dogma and all that blah 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 whatever okay so He's depicted mostly with a cloak, but he could also be seen with a top hat on or with a black suit on like the Loa, like the Barons. And Rosa Cavetta is seen with a half skeleton face. What it represents is a, is a concept of beauty on one side and death on the other side. It basically means that nothing is forever and everything is constantly changing. It also represents the fact that life is death and death is life because as soon as you are born into this existence, as soon as you are born into what we call life, you are dying because without death, there would be no life. Without life, there would be no death. So my personal league is of the cemetery, hence why they're associated with skull faces. In this line, we find death in a most active form. What I mean by that is, in a Kwambanda, when you get marked your spirit, or, or when, when, if you were to read about Kwambanda spirits, you're going to learn that there's that these books are, these books, Kumbanda Spirit, are open to the public, okay? You go online and you can read about Kumbanda if you want, and it has all kinds of information about this path. And in every Kumbanda book, it basically, well, not every, but a lot of them will explain to you how there's different leagues of spirit you could work with. And you'll get your queen and your, and your king that work together, and there's a list of spirits that work underneath them as your league when you get initiated into the group. So my personal league are of the cemetery. And when I mean by most active, death is the most active. Basically what I'm saying is if death itself can communicate, this is the league where they communicate the most. So in every single religion, even Christianity has taught us there is an angel of death. You call him Ezekiel, you could call him, in Ifa we call him, or he, he or she, Iku. 
in Mexico, they call her Santa Murta. Whatever name you want to give it, this league is where these spirits communicate. I like to call them the angel of death or the angels of death. In some stories, the angel of death can be feminine. In some stories, the angel of death can be masculine. So when these spirits communicate, they communicate in a very distinct manner and they carry very distinct energies within them. For those of you who have been following me, I share a lot of information about the Neturu, who are the Egyptian gods and goddesses. And I also share information about the Orishas because I am an Ianifa and I practice Isheshe work. So just like the Orishas and the Neturu, they manifest their self very distinctly with very with very loud characteristics to show that this is who they are, this is how they act, this is how they communicate, this is who they are they are in the universe and this is their purpose and and whatnot. So this is how death spirits com communicate is is basically what I, what I'm saying. They communicate in a very very distinctive way. Okay? So through this league, this is the league that they communicate through. These spirits can be very sexual because like I said earlier, death is life and life is death so to create life in this dimension actually not even just this dimension this all uh, multiple di dimensions within this universe the concept of sex as a mixing masculine and feminine energy must cons must exist to create what we call now the universe so this is why death spirits are associated with a lot of sexual energy because if you practice Orisha work or Neturu work, especially Orisha work is very inanimate about teaching what spirits give can also take. And every Orisha has its opposite, as in they have their Ire, as in their ascended version, and their Asogbo, which is their descended version of their self. Because the whole entire universe is made of masculine and feminine energy, light dark, yin, yang. Therefore, death spirits are associated with sexual energy. Why? Because change in existence must be associated with the concept of sex. They're also very dangerous. And to an unknowledgeable person, they can be perceived and seen as evil. When I say unknowledgeable, it is because to people who are uneducated on the spiritual realm, they will assume and think death spirits are evil because of dogma, colonialism, and the inability to accept the fact that your life consists of death energy as well. And because we fear death itself, we fear the beings that are associated with death. So it's normal or typical for the human being to want to demonize or label death spirits as evil, which is ignorant if you think about it, because everything and everyone must die at some point. Every flower that blooms must wilt. Every human that is born must return back Every person is born out of dirt and must return back to dirt. And we fear that. Do we fear death? Or do we fear where we go after death? That's the question. So, like I said, to the unknowledgeable mind, a person would call them evil. They are not evil. There are forces of nature that exist within this universe and they are much needed like any other Orisha, like any other Neturu, like any other Loa that is needed in this universe or God or goddess or angel or demon or whatever you want to call it. They are needed like any other force of nature that is needed in this universe. So I'm sure some of you might be asking, well, why would I work with them? Why would anybody work with them? Well, I can't speak for everybody else. The reason why I work with them is because this is my purpose. They claimed me, and they've obviously clearly have walked with me since I was born into this existence. This is my purpose. It is not everyone's purpose. I've met 
only one other person who was assigned or was marked the same exact spirit as I was. Only one other person, and he is all the way in Brazil. I am in the U.S. right now. So everyone's purpose is not the same. But there are a lot of people who worked with similar beings, like the Loa in Voodoo or in Voodoon. So it's just my, it's just, it's, everyone's purpose is different. Now, why would anybody in general work with them outside the concept of purpose? Because like I've tried to share in a lot of my Orisha videos, when a force of nature is able to give you something, it is also able to take. Therefore, any being in this universe that is able to take from you is also able to give back to you. So the reason why we do Arisha work and the reason why we do Neturu work or why we do Vodun work or Loa work, whatever work that you do, the reason why, or Palo, the reason why we do this is because we're appeasing energies so we can live a whole peaceful life, will for purposeful life. And that's why we do it. So the reason why I am personally supposed to be working with these beings and why anyone would work with death spirits is because death spirits come with not only death, they come with losses, they come with sickness. Now think about the opposite of that. If you look up images of Santa Murta, you'll realize a lot of people associate her with money. Because why? Because what is the opposite of losses? Wealth, money, things, materialistic things is the opposite of losses. When if they're associated with sickness and disease, what is the opposite of sickness and disease? Health, health, life. If they're associated with a short life, if you are being taken before your time, what is the opposite of that? They're associated with long life long, healthy, fulfilled life. This is why we communicate. This is why we work with these beings because that which gives us shall take it away. That which taketh shall giveth. I know it sounds really Christian of me to say it like that, but this is the reason why we work with these beings. So I'm just going to share my personal experience with my personal Pampa Jira, who is Rosa Cavera. All of the Cavera, or all of, well, yeah, all of the Caveras are different, but all of the Pompageros are different. There are multiple, multiple different Pompageros, okay? So a lot of people online are doing this big giant fad of, oh, we're some Pompagero and she's going to give you confidence and all that. Yes, Pompagero will give you confidence. Yes, she is sexual. Yes, she is that powerful woman, an independent woman. Yes. But please know. Pompadour is not just one Arisha or one spirit or one goddess. She is multiple. And either you have a connection with her and either this is your path or either it's not. And it is what it is. Okay, so my personal Pompadour who walks with me is Rosa Cavetta, who is associated with death itself. When I say death itself, I mean the actual concept of when something transitioned because if you do some research on Eshu, Eshu is associated with the crossroads and the doorway who what also I like to associate with alchemy and change so when you see something transitioning from one aspect to the next aspect, he's associated with the doorways and the dimensions and communication because he's associated with doors opening and closing. And this is why we, this is why we appease Eshu so we could have doors open. Or if doors are closed, we appease Eshu so the doors will open. So basically... This version of Eshu of Pompadour is associated with the change of life and death because that's an opening and closing area of life and death. As in when you see a flower wilt, the alchemy in the change of the flower going from life and going to death is called the, as alchemy. And it's the change in the doorways of the universe closing and opening and changing into one form and moving and transitioning to the next form. So for those of you who want to know a higher understanding of the powers and the forces of nature of Pompeo and Eshu, this is who they are. They are the change 
of everything that happens in the universe all around us. Every time you die and you change from light to death, it is issue that is associated. If you do with science and you do with biology and you're dealing with an animal changing from the from the butterfly to something else, if you're trying to turn one chemical to the next chemical in science, that is the changing of energies. That is Eshu or Pompajira in the universe working in the changing of all chemicals and all aspects of the universe, okay? So Pompajira Rosa Cavera is associated with life and death, death in life. My personal experience when I first met Pompajira, I had no idea who she was. So when you're associated with a Pompajira issue, they typically tend to adopt their practitioners. Not every time, but a good majority of the time, they tend to adopt their practitioners. As in, they will pop into someone's life and start communicating and talking to them. And they're like, whoa, what is this being talking to me? And then all of a sudden, they'll forward them to somebody who knows magically and then they're enlightened on, oh my God, it was a Pompajira spe uh, spirit speaking to me or basically what it happens. So, so these beings adopted me. My first experience with Pompajira, I was meditating in my pyramid. I make a lot of videos on pyramid magic and pyramid work, okay? Because also, I also practice kemeticism as well. So if you like that stuff, subscribe to my channel. So I was meditating in my pyramid and I kept hearing a voice in my pyramid kept saying, I couldn't understand her because it was kind of it was kind of like I heard I I heard her kind of yelling at me, but it was because I was kind of in a meditative state where I couldn't one hundred percent understand what she was saying. I kept hearing Pombajura or Pomahira or Pomagira or Pomadira. I couldn't understand what she was saying. Right, so I was like I was trying to I was actually meditating on something else. I can't even remember what I was meditating on. And I kept hearing this, and I this is literally what it felt like. She was like, talk to me, talk to me, hello, talk to me. And she was very, very demanding. So for those of you who want to work with Pompajira, just to let you know, she's a very demanding spirit, okay? So I asked my spouse, who was a Babalao, I asked him at the time, I was like, I kept hearing this name. And he was like, oh, that's the female version of Eshu, she's a Kwambanda spirit. And I was like, oh, okay. So she started teaching me things. I made another video on this. And I will tag that video with this video. So you can have a longer version of the story. I'm not going to keep it too long about this right now. So I'm going to go into other things in this video. But if you want to hear that longer version of the story, I will tag that video with this video. I made a separate video on it back in the day, back when that happened. About I've been in, I've been marked by Kwambanda Spirits. It's been... Almost a year, but it was been, it's been over six months since since this happened. So that's my first experience with Pompajira. Now, the Pompajira that I have now tends to have a different kind of energy, and I'm still learning. So when you get marked your 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 spirit, your it, your job before you get them seated into their altar all the way is to learn your spirit, to learn their characteristics, learn their likes and dislikes, and just learn to be one with them and stuff like that. So right now, I realized the first time I met her, she had a much more hype, hyper kind of um, typical Pompajira energy when she first approached me. Since I've been marked Rosa Cavetta, I have realized that she, her energy feels a little more serious than the first time I've spoken to Pompajira before I was marked. So Pompajira did approach me before I was ever marked into Kwambanda at all, before I ever knew, before I ever knew her. So there are different aspects of Pompajira. Rosa Cavetta, the one that I, that I have now, um, she... I got marked her a little bit before I ended up receiving Oshun. So because I practice Ifa, I also have Oshun. Love Oshun. I have Oshun Sheke She, who is known as the warrior aspect of Pompajira. And for a while there, I was getting confused on who was speaking to me. I was like, okay, is this Oshun's communicating with me or is this Pompajira? So Pompajira's energy can be a lot like Oshun because she is very passionate she was very romantic. She was very loving, but she's very hot-tempered, way more hot-tempered than Oshun. 
But the Oshun that I have tends to be a hot-tempered Oshun. So at first I got confused and I was like, well, which one's speaking to me? Is it Oshun speaking to me or is it Papa Jira? So Papa Jira made it pretty clear one day. She kept popping up. She, this energy kept popping up during readings. My, my spouse is an Awa when he was doing readings. And he noticed I got a, a warning on, hey, you need to feed Ogun because I recently got crowned Ogun. And Ogun is saying you need to feed Ogun because something might happen, right? And I don't want to scare you guys away from this path or please do not demonize its being, but this is my personal experience, okay? So the reading popped up and it said feed Ogun. So I gave Ogun an offer and within a few days later, something blew up in the kitchen and it was a glass that was sitting on top of the stove and it exploded, boom, exploded in my kitchen and glass splattered everywhere. Right before I walked into the kitchen, thank you, Ogun, he protected me from it. But basically what it was was Pompajira letting me know I'm here and this is what my energy is like. Pompajira is no joke. And now since then, I know the difference between Pompajira energy communicating with me or Oshun communicating with me. My Oshun is much more sweeter, but she could be turned to the under to the other side easily. But Pompajur is a lot more warmer consistently. Mine is, if that makes sense. It's hard to explain, but it's hard to explain when you're talking about energies here. You know what I mean? I learned Pompajur wanted me to be aware, hey, this is me and this is my energy. And now I know. Pompajur kicks ass, okay? Because I was associated with another pantheon, I was protected by Ogun, nothing happened to me. Glass got over the, all over the kitchen, but nothing hit me. I was protected, Ogun protected me. But now I know, I can energetically feel the difference between Oshun and Pompajira now. They're similar, but not at the same time. Hard to explain. So that's my experience with Pompajira. There's much more than that too. But um, before I get into that, um, my first experience with Tata Caveda. Okay, I made, another, I made another video on my experience um, with the Kumbanda spirit, and I'll tag that video with this one where I mentioned my experience with Tata Kaveda. I'm going to reiterate on that real quick since I'm doing this video today. Um, so Tata Kaveda, the first time I've ever met Tata Kaveda, it was when I first got my hand in Ifa. This is my first step I took into the priesthood, and I received my warriors, I received my Eshu, and my Ogun, and my, and my, Acho, and, and my Achosi, and my first hand Nifa, all at the same time. And um, I was reading um, this book called Eshu, E-X-U, in the, the Kumbanda version of Eshu, not the E-S-U, as in the Ifa version. I was reading the Eshu book, a Kumbanda version, version of Eshu, all the different Eshus. So around that time, when you read up on spirits and you speak about them and you acknowledge them, they know and they acknowledge you too. So basically, when I first got my hand Nifa and I was working with my, um, I don't even, did I even have my hand Nifa yet? I don't see, don't remember. I might have not even had my Nifa yet, my hand Nifa. It might have been around that time. But anyways, the first time Tata came to me, he was the most he is the most physical, non-physical being I have ever felt in my entire life. I was laying in bed when he approached me. And I started to go into a half asleep, half awake mode. Okay. And in my mind's eye, I seen a spirit at the top of a staircase looking at me. And his face was all white and he was wearing a black cloak over his head now because i've been doing this kind of work for the last few years i've been doing this for a while i am now aware of the difference between me just having a casual dream and actual gods or goddesses or spirits trying to communicate with me in a dreamlike state because i am already aware of the difference i knew when i was in that state of mind i wasn't even asleep all the way i started to get visions and stuff that this was a being trying to communicate. And I said, who are you? And as soon as I said, who are you? He came out of the dream and he was in the living room and he splashed my face with water. So in Ifa, 
or actually not just ifa, a lot of practices, we, we do um, a practice where we do cooling ritual, where we go tutu eshu, tutu egun, tutu ogun, tutu ochoshi, to cool the energy of the street, to cool the energy of our home. And what we do, we take a bowl of water and we splash water on the ground. So basically what happened is Tata took water the same way when we are invoking spirits, we invoke them by splashing water in front of the altar. He invoked me by doing the same exact thing and splint and splashed me. In, and I literally, literally could feel it splashing my face. I felt it and I felt the water hit my face and it, I mean, it made me jump because I felt him splash me in the face. And this is what he said to me in a very distinct voice. He went very close to my head and he said, I have the name of your enemies. And then he disappeared. Okay, I swear to God this freaking happened. And I know for sure this happened because he has a very distinct voice and he hasn't only came to me, but he has came to my spouse who has heard that very exact voice. His voice is very distinct the way he sounds. So when he speaks, I know it is him. And when he speaks, he gets very close to my head and very close to my ear, specifically my left side of the ear when he communicates. This is my first experience with Tata Kaveda. And since I seen him, I got very, very obsessive over him. I was like, oh my God. As soon as I seen him, I was like, babe, you not believe what happened to me. And I started yelling across the apartment. And I was like, babe, you have to know. And I was like freaking out like this being came and he talked to me. I don't know who he is. I don't know what he is. I don't know what his name is. He talked to me and I was freaking out. And he was like, why is this person talking to you? You got to ask him why he's talking to you. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, we got to find out. So <laughs> he's spiritual and very aware too. So he was there with me. He was like, we got to find out who this is, you know? So I ran into Tata Kaveda's page. The very next day I was reading a book, it said... Tata Kaveda, associated with the black cape and the white face. I was like, oh, fuck, man. This is him right here. I swear to God, this is him. And he is him. And the reason why I know it was him is because when I got marked my Kwambanda spirits, it came up on the reading and said, yes, Tata Kaveda has claimed you as his own. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. So, not only that, that's my first experience with Tata Kaveda. I became very obsessed with this spirit since then because he's so physical and it feels like he's literally there when he speaks. I can literally hear him as if there's a person next to me speaking. It's loud, it's clear, and it could be creepy and kind of scary because he has that energy. But out of every Orisha, out of every Neturu, out of every ancestor I have ever spoken to, Tata Kaveda is the most physical being I have ever heard ever worked with, ever came across in my entire life. That is my personal experience. Now, when you get marked your spirits, you have a league that comes with them. So I don't want to say their names too much. And the reason why I don't is because I do have my, my altar sitting behind me and I do not want to invoke or summon their spirits because their spirits can be very heavy, the league that I work with. So um, I'm not going to say the the Kumbanda version. I guess I'll just say it in English for you, okay? So so when I first got marked my Kumbanda spirit, within three days, my league that I'm supposed to work with started approaching me. They're like, pretty much just like, oh, hey, yo, look, somebody got marked into our league. We're going to go say what's up. That's basically what happens, okay? So my f within the first three days, not only did I keep getting images of Pampa Jira and Eshu, and skull face beings approaching me and I kept seeing their faces approach this to seeing their images and stuff like that approach me because the Cavetas always have the skull face the leagues they have the skull faces um but this this was hilarious so Esh, so Eshu is his hilarious okay so if you practice this kind of work um you I feel like Eshu is one of my favorite being uh, Orisha to work with the reason why is is because he's funny He's fun, he is associated with being a trickster, he's goofy, and he can be very, very playful. Out of all the Orishas, Eshu is the most playful Orisha that you could work with, okay? He could also be the most dang one of the most dangerous too, by the way, okay? So, when I first got marked by Kombanda Spirits, the league was like, oh, hey, what's up? Someone's marked, let's go say what's up to her. So they came to my house, right? And I was in a half-asleep and half-awake mode. 
there was a issue sitting on my couch and I was sleeping in the living room at this time and I seen him sitting on my couch and he had a black suit on and a black hat on and I found out that this is Eshu Pagan there's another word for him I'm not gonna say it right now I don't want to you know some of that energy too much um and he was joking about another Eshu okay so three Eshus came to me around within three days three of them came to me one with the black suit on and a black top hat and one of the little issues. So a lot of time issue is associated with being either a old wise man or he's associated with being a child. So this issue, another issue came to me and he had a little black suit on and he was short. He was like a little kid or like a midget and he had a black face. And I say black, I mean the color black, not like African-American. I mean like black 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 okay like the sky like in the and the universe black and he was glittery and glistening and he had horns horns on his head okay he i believe he came to me because he was associating with him with the energy of blackness and darkness so he came to me and manifested himself that way and he so he approached me and another one approached me who was associated issue of the dirt the third one was issue they call him issue of the dirt and he is associated with obviously the dirt well because he's associated with herbalism and healing and earth and working with the earth is basically what he's associated with and that's why he's called that so when they came issue of the dirt came to me and he wasn't speaking to me all the way. He was kind of like, uh, uh, but he was communicating to me with his mind what he was doing. And he handed me or he was showing me bananas. Basically, what he was trying to communicate with me mentally is that if if I wanted him to speak through me it was for me to eat bananas. And I, and I and I seen like the little tiny bananas, the little small ones, not the regular banana, but the small ones. OK, so in a lot of this work, issue is associated. He likes to, he likes the little little bananas being offered to him. A lot of the a lot of issue work, we offer him little bananas. So issue pagan was on the couch and he was joking and he was saying you don't want he was like you don't want him to talk through you don't, don't let him talk through you you don't want him to talk through you not him don't choose him choose me and he was making fun of the other other issue making fun of him and i didn't understand what that meant at first okay at first i was like this is hilarious as was being funny he was making fun of another version of himself which is hilarious right if you think about it because it's an issue versus issue right this is what i found out months later what that joke meant this is what's hilarious with working with spirits is a spirit will say something to you one day and then you won't get it until months later or even a year later. So months later, this is what I found out why issue one issue was making fun of the other issue was because if you look up issue of the dirt issue does this version of issue does not speak. He grunts. He does not know how to speak. He, he, he just grunts. That's why the issue was making fun of him and saying, Hi, you don't want him to speak. You want him? You want to have, have, have me speak through you. Don't let him speak through you. And he was laughing and pointing and making fun of him, right? And I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was just hilarious, right? But later on, I found out this is what he meant. He was making fun of him and because Eshu of the dirt, can, he only grunts and he doesn't speak. When he when he speaks, because a lot of times when you work with Komando and when you work even with Orisha work, even Kemeticism work, spirits will speak through you. What they do is they mount your body, they go into your body and they will speak through you. And they have characteristics and specific ways they speak, specific ways their voices sound. And it could be kind of scary if a woman has a male Orisha speak or a male Eshu speak through her because her voice will drop and she could sound like a man speaking. Or a female and a man, his voice could go up and it sounds like a female speaking. They will speak through their practitioner. This is why issue was joking about the other issue and this is what i found out later on so the negative thing that happened was um one of the issues the one with the top hat is associated with arguments and confusion so there's a story of issue where issue was wearing a black hat on one side and the other side of his hat is red or there's another version where one side of his face is painted white and the other side of his face is painting black and he walks down the street 
and one person, I'm not going to tell the whole story. I don't want to get too into it. And one farmer says, oh, I've seen the person wearing a red hat. And the other person says, no, I've seen a person wearing a black hat. And the two people start to argue, okay? This is why issue is, is associated with confusion and why we need to let go of our ego and pride because he will teach us the hard way sometimes if we are unable to let go of our pride and our, and our, and our ego. He will purposely confuse people who are very, very egotistical to teach them a lesson, sometimes a hard way. So... This issue with the with the hat that came in um, brought brought in some energy in her because because when they come around they have energy within them. Not all issues. Every issue in Kumbanda has a different vibe, different energy to them. This particular one caused me and my me and my spouse never argue. We we get along very very well. We have a very very healthy loving relationship. This is the first time I think we have ever argued like ever is when this version of Eshu came around we ended up doing some we had to do some spiritual work we had to appease Eshu and stuff like that clean up the energy and stuff and he and, and this Eshu tends to make people argue so when they come around if you were to get initiated into Kumbanda they they come around to teach you what their energy is like the first time I met Pompajira I may I'm going to tag a video with this video on my longer version experience of Pompajira and what her energy has done and how it has shifted the energy in my neighborhood. So you can have an higher understanding of how these spirits can totally shift the energy within your home and in neighborhood and even in other people's lives. And this is why we work with these beings. So we can either send that energy or take that energy away. Okay? Because these energies in these beings exist in the universe. What I'm saying is, for example, Eshu Pagan is associated with confusion and arguments. But does it mean that only this, he's like some kind of spirit that just floats around and does it? No, it's a force of nature that exists in the universe, as in the force of nature that causes confusion, for example, exists in the universe. And this force of nature can work within the issue, the spirit of issue. Okay, so when we appease that energy, we clear up the energy to bring us clarity and focus, focus and structure in our life. You see what I'm saying? So... This is what he was teaching me. He was teaching me, like, I'm part of your league. This is what I do, and this is what I take of the way. This is what I give, and this is what I take, okay? So that's my experience with him, and that's my experience with Issue of the Dirt. My experience with Issue of the Dirt, I've read about Issue of the Dirt, and a lot of people would say that he's very heavy. Um, I think he's nice. Now, I don't know if anybody else has had another experience with him. I like Issue of the Dirt. When, I, when I've met him, he's very nice. And he didn't disturb my energy whatsoever. I think he's just more associated with healing herbs, working with the earth and stuff like that. Now, if anybody else has another idea of who he is, I'm sure maybe. But because um, I've read that some people feel like he's heavy. Um, if he is, I don't feel like he's as heavy as a Kaveta. So his energy doesn't bother me. I feel like he's sweet and he's nice. He could be kind of scary because he came to me looking. So he's always associated with being slouched on the ground like this. He never stands up straight. He never sits up straight. He's always slouched over. And he could and he could appear looking like a gremlin type of being. And he doesn't look like a typical issue. Because he's associated with the earth and dirt, he's, he's, he always sits down on all his all his fours or he has his hands on the ground. Or sometimes he could be associated with one hoof, with one leg being a hoof and, and stuff like that. But he, he's not a typical issue to see. He looks a lot different. Um, I've read that people think that he's heavy. Personally, when he's came to me, I like his energy. I think he's nice. I don't think he hasn't. He seems calm to me. He he doesn't bother me. His energy doesn't bother me at, at all. I kind of like him. I like Eshu of the Dirt. But that's just me. To each their own, you know? Um, the child Eshu, from my experience, I had a crazy day when the child Eshu came around. Because he's associated with kid-like Eshu, kid-like kid -like Eshu, kid-like energy, he could do kid-like stuff. As in, if you had a kid in your home and they're kind of like a bad little kid, that's kind of the annoyances, basically that energy of what he kind of gives off. So the day the child issue came to me, he was letting me know, this is your league, this is what you're dealing with, this is kind of like what we do and we don't do and stuff like that. So that day when I had the little issue come around, 
I had a little annoyances happen. I think I lost something that day. I think when I got to work, our neighbor, our, our at least our our salon didn't get robbed, but the neighbor got the two of our neighbors got robbed that day, and their windows got broken, and all their neighbors were agitated. I rode the bus that day because my car was around that time. I was getting my car worked on, and the bus shut down in the middle of the road. I had to walk to the stop. Like little annoying stuff like that happened that day, you know. That's what happened when that energy was around. So that's my personal experience with my league. I also had issue of the black cape approach me who's associated. He manifests himself as a vampire. I made a blog about him recently. I actually wrote a blog on my Facebook business page because he taught me some things. He taught me about energy vampirism and how that energy of other people being energy vampires are here to teach us a lesson. Um, they're basically energies here to teach us to be more aware of the way we speak. He told me that when non-physical beings ask you questions, you need to be very careful how you answer them. There is no such thing as I don't know. When a non-physical being asks you a question, you need to know how to answer them. And if you look into the Book of the Dead or into Cometicism, there's areas of the book that says there are certain things you need to say when you meet non-physical beings on the other side um, when you pass away. So basically, Esho of the Black Cape was explaining to me more in depth on that concept. Uh, and he also was telling me that um, passiveness is not confidence. He told me that in, it's sad that in, in this society, we have been taught to ignore and to behave passive and see it as a strength. Eshu the Black Cape told me no. Because when you die and you lose your body, there is no such thing as ignoring and there is no such thing as passiveness. Because what is in your face and what is real is real and what you're dealing with and the energy that you are in, it is there and it is that and you cannot ignore it away or pass it away and pretend it doesn't exist. Therefore, trying to act like you could do that here is just as delusional as thinking you could just do that on another side. So this is one of the main things that Eshu of the Black Cape has taught me. He is also um, associated with the bat because I'm sure you've seen a lot of movies where um, vampires turn into bats. Basically what that is is having control over your astral body. So you have the body that you're in because you believe this is the body that you are in. And a lot of times when people die, they actually still believe they're in that body. That's why when you see ghosts and spirits, they are still manifesting their self in the outfits they died in or the outfits they got married in or an outfit that they had a vacation in. Whatever aspect in their life they're revolving their mind around, they will manifest that into reality. So issue of the black cape, I've only seen him a couple times. I'm sure I've seen him more. It was telling me basically is i need to learn how to put myself into a bat's body and i'm sure the reason why he told me to start off with the bat is because they have more of a similar um setup as we do as in our arms and our legs and stuff like that because we're more associated with that shape of the body than we are with a snake or a dog for example who stand on all fours or an animal that doesn't have legs or arms at all so what he was saying is if you want to learn how to control your astral body it is best to learn the um the bodies of animals or trees or anything you want to manifest yourself as to study it to study the animal the body of an animal to study the muscle to study the bones to study the behavior and what it actually feels like to be in the animal body and the animal spirit so you know how to control your astral body your idea of self because when you leave your body to be truly free is to not be attached to the, your false identity, which is this human self. To think that the only reality exists is this plane. To be free from that. And that's what issue of the Black Cape was telling me. Is to learn confidence and to stop allowing people to feed off my energy. And to stop acting as if people who do feed off your energy is pointless. Because they're here to teach us a lesson. They're here to teach us how to be stronger and be better aspects of ourself. 
Because without anyone pressuring us, without anyone pushing us, without anyone, with, without anyone to make us question ourselves, then we never will. I mean, how are we supposed to know how to fight for life or fight for ourselves or fight for our reality or fight for anything if we don't have anything that's here fighting against us? We need all of this. Without no friction, there is no existence. So basically what the issue was teaching me is that he teaches me to stop being so judgmental. Yes, I hate narcissists and I can't stand them. This is why I need to learn work, work with these beings more because they're going to teach me more on how to have a higher understanding of these energies and how they could work for us instead of against us. How do these uncomfortable energies can teach us to be the best versions of ourselves instead of suppress us into the worst versions of ourselves? This is what Eshu of the Black Cape has taught me. So I want to move on to Pampa Jira and her connection to the Iami. So for those of you who do not know who the Iami are, Iami Aje is a Yoruba word for endearment that is used to describe a woman with spiritual and cosmic powers. So in the physical form or as a human, there are a group called Yami, and you can look them up online. And it is a secret society of women who are part of the Yami. Now, all females have the power of the AJ, which basically means the cosmic powers and spiritual powers. Does that mean everybody is Yami? All females are Yami or AJ? Does it mean that all females are Yami Osaranga? Or Osaranga? Osor sorry. Osaranga, no. Iami Osaranga are basically fem females who can astral project and have control over their astral body. So no, all women cannot be Iami. Okay, all women do not have the power to be this type of Ajay. Yes, all women have cosmic powers and spiritual powers if they tap into their self. But does not mean all of them have earned the right and respect to be considered an Aje? No, absolutely not. Because it takes a lot of good character and control over our astral self to be able to be considered that. But the reason why I'm explaining this is because if you look up Eon Me, that's the first thing your Google search bar is going to take you. Now, when I say Pompajir is associated with the Eon Me, yes, she is associated with helping myself i can't say all people everyone's purpose isn't to learn this my purpose is when i say pompajira is associated with the iami i mean she is associated with the force of forces of nature in the universe who are the iami not the women who are in the society of iami okay when i say the forces of nature i mean the mothers of the universe iami does not mean witch the word witch came from colonialism, okay, and dogmatic mindsets. Iami means the, it's basically the mothers of the universe. So the whole entire universe came out of darkness as in the womb of the universe. The womb of the universe is a female aspect of the universe who we call the mothers of the universe, who we call the Iami. So, there's a story that my spouse always tells me, and I like this story because I think it's kind of cute, that when the universe came into existence, the universe, Olo, who we call Olodumari. Olodumari is the whole entire universe of existence. All the Orishas in one is Olodumari. When Olodumari came into existence, he realized, he was like, huh, there's somebody else here with me. Do you know who that somebody else was when he came into existence? It was Eshu. Because why? Earlier I explained how Eshu is changed from one aspect to the other. Therefore, when Elodomari came into existence, Eshu was there. But remember what I said earlier? Pompajira is the female aspect of Eshu. Therefore, Pompajira, as in the womb of existence, is associated with the Iyami, who are the mothers of the universe. A lot of people don't talk about that. I have not run into one video who mentions Pompajira being associated with the mothers of the universe and the existence of the universe and the Iyami of the universe.
Okay, this is what Pompadour explained to me. I'm not going to get too much into Iami because I'm still getting to know Iami myself. But Pompadour explained this to me. And I felt like, oh, like, oh my God, when she explained it to me, I was like, man, my brain's going to explode. This is a lot of information, Pompadour. <laughs> so Pompadour is not just some spirit that just brings you confidence and passion and love. She is a force of nature that is older than Aludamari. Because Aludamari came out of the womb of the universe. And Pompadura, because Eshu and Pompadura already existed. This is how old these beings are in existence. They have been existing. They're not just some spirits who float around and communicate. Okay, They're not ghosts. They're not goblins. They're aspects of the universe that help control the universe. They're the laws of the universe they are our part there are an aspect of our creator god my experience i want to get into my experience with i do want to make a video on iami but i'm not ready to do that and the reason why i'm not is because they're so deep they're so hard to understand because they're before existence no human being can really understand existence itself so who are we to try to explain existence before existence I would like to get more into it, but that's a totally separate video. Um, so I'm going to move on to my experience with my king, Eshu Tata Kaveda. I love to talk about Pompadour. I love to talk about Tata Kaveda because Tata Kaveda, he is intense, okay? When I started setting, when I first got, I mean, when I first got marked, I was intent to have all these different issues show up to my apartment. Um, my spouse actually heard the little issue running up and down the stairs one time when we were doing when we were doing um, ancestral work one time. And it's funny because when you hear him walking around the house or running up and down the stairs, it literally sounds like kid feet stomping up and down the stairs and through the apartment. It's cute and it's scary at the same time. You're like, oh my god, his spirit went around. It sounds like a little kid stomping around and moving around. It's it's the way his feet sound. It's like it's it's cute and. A little spooky too at the same time. <laughs> cute, his little feet are cute when you're moving around the house. But um, Tata Caveta, when I first got marked Tata and Pompadura, I kept feeling a force standing behind me constantly, all the time, to the point where I kept looking behind and I was like, like freaking out. Like there's something behind me. It literally felt like there's something behind me. So I finally did some readings on it and found out that yes, it, 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 I was like thinking, is it like, is it like an egoon or is it like, you know, is it a attached spirit that I'm supposed to have on me? Like what, what is it? And I do, and I had some readings on to find out, yes, it was Tata Caveda because he is considered walking behind me. So he's literally has my back. He literally walks behind me at, at all times. So. Oh, somebody asked, what's up with the devil horns? The reason why I did it, because if you look up Quimbanda spirits, a lot of the issues in Pompadura is associated with horns. My personal issue in Pompadura are not associated with horns. Mine are associated with skull faces. But the reason why I have the little shadow with the horns behind me, because if you go and Google and look up Quimbanda spirits, you'll notice a whole lot of them are associated with, with horns on their head. Like the little issue that I explained earlier that I had stumping around and running around the house earlier. So, moving on. My personal experience with Tata Caveta is a, a lot. He has not only made me aware that he is around. Excuse me, did somebody say I'm annoying and I'm a fraud? Jeff Sirs, I don't know who you are, but I am officially initiated or marked my Kombanda spirits. So, please do not call me a fraud because you're pissing me off and don't piss my spirits off, okay? If you continue to call on my page and insult me, I will have you removed from my page and don't make me do more than that. So please be respectful if you're going to be on my page. Thank you. Moving on. If anybody would like to know who was the person who initiated into me into Kumbanda, please go ahead and shoot a message and I will forward the Torero to you if you are um, interested, by the way. So, my experience with Tata um, is I feel him standing behind me all the time. Um, I do notice that Tata 
came to me in a vision one time. And if you're associate, associate with cometicism, there is a netter who is called Sicker. Sicker is the netter of the dead. So Tata came to me in a vision one time. And if you look at vision, vision or, or uh, pictures of Tata Caveda, there is a, a lot of the pictures are associated with him sitting on a throne, okay? And so Tata Caveda came to me in a vision and he was sitting on a throne. And then he stood up off of his throne and then he pointed his finger at the sun setting and then his face turned into Sicker, the netter of the dead. And he was pointing at the sunset and then I seen um, kind of like the commandments like you see in the, in the Bible appeared and there was light shining out of it and I seen a moth a moth flying from it. I haven't exactly figured out what that means exactly yet, but it, it, sounds, it sounds pretty pretty deep to me, but um, basically Tata was letting me know that he's connected to, to Sicker, the, the, the netter of Sicker. If you look up Tata Caveda in the books, Tata Caveda is associated with Egypt. And all the books of Kumbanda, Tata Caveda states that he's from Egypt. So, or Kemet back in the day was called Kemet. So Tata Caveda showed up to me and he turned into Sicker in one of my visions to let me know that this is the energy that he is associated with through time. So in all these African traditions, these energies have changed from pantheons to pantheons. So these gods will communicate or goddesses or Arisha or Neturu will communicate in different ways through different pantheons, different traditions in different ways, but they will still be their self, if that makes sense. They'll still have their purpose. They'll still have their energies, but they might show up with a different name or a different look, but still have the same purpose, same job and stuff like that. So what Tata was basically telling me is that his lineage or his line came all the way from Egypt. And if you read about him in Kumbana book, it states that Tata Kavera is associated with Egypt. And he goes all the way back to the priesthood in ancient Kemet to the netter who is who we call Sikr, the netter of death. Because Tata Kavera is the issue of death or the issue of the cemetery, issue of the Kalunga or issue of the graveyard. Okay, so that's basically what he was telling me, what he was saying to me. So, Tata has a, has, is, is very, very temperamental, very temperamental, and he is very, very, very protective of his practitioners, and especially people who have been abused. Let me remind the person who tried to abuse me in the video, Tata Caveda does not like abusive behavior, okay? And he will protect his practitioners from people who like to practice bad character, mentally, emotionally, and physically abuse people. He does not fly with Tata Caveda. He does not play, and he will go visit people. And it sets you an example, okay? He came to me one time in a vision, and I have not sat in front of Tata Kaveda and ever told Tata about my ex, who was my oldest daughter's baby's father. But because Tata Kaveda and these forces of nature are beyond time and space, Tata knows of my ex. He knows of my daughter. Um, obviously, he is a non-physical being. These beings were very, very smart. He came to me in a vision and started cussing. And he came to me. This is what I seen. He was a grim rip. He had a skeleton face and he had a cape and he ripped his cape. And he said, I'm going to, and I could, I think I tuned it out because I think he cussed so much about it. And he's like, I'm going to, uh, something to him. He said he was going to do something to him. Right? So I called my daughter and I said, my spirit, Tata Caveta came to me. And he warned me about your father. Um, can you tell me if there's anything going on in that home? Have you spoke to him? Have you spoken to your other, your stepmother? What's going on? She said, I haven't spoke to him. I don't know. I said, um, something might happen because the spirit came to me and he told me he's very upset about him. And 
I know when Tata Cavetta said he's going to do something, he's going to do something. He ain't playing. Okay? So, within a week later, my daughter contacts me and says, my, dad, my, my father's in jail. He said, my father's in jail for domestic violence. And um, he's still locked up now. So, and she said, how did you know this was going to happen? How did you know something was going to happen to him? And I said... Tata Cavetta came to me. I had to explain to her in detail who the spirit was and how he's associated with Kumbanda, how I have an altar of him in my home and how, we, how, how I speak to him. And he told me prior to it happening, my evidence is my daughter. She contacted me and said, holy crap. And her boyfriend knew too because she told her boyfriend at the time when I told her, I said, something's going to happen. He's going to pay a visit to their house, he told me he's going over there because he doesn't like him, he doesn't like the way he treats you, he doesn't like the way he treated me. And within a week later, my daughter contacted me and said, yes, he's in jail, he's locked up right now. I hope he's not out. Um, if SU had him locked up, I have a feeling he's not gonna get out anytime soon. Tata does not play, okay? So, um, this is my experience with him. Um, there was a time where a dude was hitting on me one time. And so because Kumbanda spirits are known for um, mounting their practitioners and speaking through them, for the first time ever, I felt like Tata, like literally almost put his head through my head one time. I know that sounds weird. So there was a guy that would not leave me alone on Facebook, right? He, he This person would not leave me alone. He was not getting a point. I'm like, people out here are thirsty, Okay motherfuckers out here are thirsty and they were desperate and it's sad okay so i had a person hit on me right he would not get the point i said leave me alone i am engaged leave me alone tata came through me and he was like back the fuck off you know so when tata comes through he doesn't only come through he could come through energy he these kumbanda spirits will follow people around Okay, they follow people. Not only do they will say something to you, to your face, and communicate with you one time, but they will follow you until you change your character. And if you offer an offer to these beings and still not change your character, they don't give a fuck. Okay, I'm just going to let you know right now that if you piss off a, kum a kumbanda spirit, and they're coming after you because you're practicing horrible, fucked up character. And you are unwilling to change your judgmental, bad, lying ass, abusive ass, mentally insane ass, gaslighting ass, whatever issues, stealing ass, whatever issues that you have, whoever's watching this video, pointing finger ass, accusing people, that type of shit. They will follow you home and fuck with you until you change your character or, and change, or until you have to kill a ram, kill a rooster, something, until you change your fucking life around, okay? And I'm going to let you know right now, these beings don't play. There's a lot of reasons. This is associated with the left-hand path, not the right-hand path, okay? The right-hand path is working with light and healing and that kind of stuff unicorns whatever you want to call it okay this is the left hand path okay these beings don't fucking play they're temperamental and they don't joke this is a warning to anybody who wants to be associated with kumbanda or whoever wants to pick a fight or start shit with a quimbandera or a quimbandero or a terrero to watch your fucking back, okay? Because from my experience, my Tata and my Rosa will do what the fuck they want to do no matter what I say. Do you think if Tata Cavera comes to me and says, I'm going to go visit your ex and I'm going to fuck him up, do you think I can sit there and tell Tata, no, please don't, please don't? He don't give a shit, okay? These are very moralistic beings. And what I mean by that is if they go after people, it's because they're doing it is because they deserve it. Okay, they're not going to go after an innocent person who doesn't deserve it. If you are being a good person, then you don't have to worry about it. If you're being an egotistical person, a prideful person, a dogmatic person, because Quimbanda has risen against dogma. 
That's the whole reason why Kumbanda has risen and became popular in the first place, is to go against dogmatic concepts. And the reason why you see Eshus and Pompagiers associated with horns is because they said, fuck the church, fuck your religious concept, fuck colonialism, fuck slavery, fuck suppression, fuck one-sidedness, fuck the rules. That's what Kumbanda is all about. That's why Kumbanda became popular. Kumbanda came about because people wanted to suppress the practice of Orisha work, make it seem like it's something it's not. They wanted to make it seem like Eshu was the devil and Eshu wasn't just a messenger. So they said, all right, you want to make it seem like Eshu's the devil? Fuck you then, the Eshu's the devil. Then. And they used that image to hold against the suppressors, the colonialists, colonialism, the enslavers. And they said, all right, you want to be scared of the devil? You want to fear witches? You want to be scared of this? Then we're going to use this against you since you want to enslave us because you want to rape our women and you want to kidnap our children. Therefore, fuck you. We have the devil. The devil's on our side. We're going to send him after you because you are a fucked up group of people. Therefore, this is why Kambanda got demonized because they use these spirits to protect them, to protect their kin, to protect their rights as a human being, to live a wholesome life, to be able to be happy. They protect these people. Yes, throughout time, it has been abused and turned into something it shouldn't be turned into at all. This is called the left-hand path. This is called black magic. This is called red magic. You can make people go insane. You can make people want to kill themselves. You can kill people with this path. Cavetas are associated with death because they can kill people. It's not a fucking joke. Okay? So for those of you who think you're going to go online, you want to Google some things, and you want to summon some spirits, it's not a joke. These beings do not play with egotistical minds. And they do not Play nice with people who want to abuse, take advantage of, or manipulate their practitioners. They do not play, okay? They don't care if you are someone's spouse, if you are their friend, if you are a male, if you are a female, what age you are. They don't care. Morals are morals. Boundaries are boundaries. Respect is respect. And you're either a respectful person and you are either practicing good character or you're not. And if you are not practicing good character, if you are not following your highest purpose, these forces of nature, whether it's through Kambanda, whether it's through Isheshe work, whether it's to, through Apollo, these forces of nature live in this universe regardless. Therefore, if you are not practicing good character, if you are abusing other people or even yourself, these beings will punish you, regardless if you believe it or not. They bring depression. They bring insanity. They bring losses. They bring diseases. They bring death, okay? They could take money from you or they could bring money from you. And just letting you know if you want to be associated in this doesn't mean that you have to be an evil person. No, you have to be a good person. And the reason why you have to know how to be a good person is because you will get fucked up if you're not. And for the people who try to use this as an excuse to do bad things, they're in complete denial. Eshu and Pompagira are, are following the rules of karma and dharma. And without these forces of nature, there would be no goodness in this universe. If you want to be protected by bad people, these are the forces of nature that protect you. These are the forces of nature we need to seek protection from. These are the forces of nature we need to apologize to and show respect to when we are not practicing good character, when we are not being respectful, when we are being ignorant, when we decide that we don't want to see beyond our own nose and beyond our own illusion. These are the beings we need to pay homage to and show respect to because these are the ones that punish us. These are the ones that have the doorways to be called the Aldragoon, which are demons which are the beings that punish us and bring us that which we do not want. They open the doorway to or from these energies. If we do not pay respects to these, the doorway can be open to positive things or negative things, or the doorway could be closed to positive things 
or negative things. My personal experience with Tata Kaveda, with these beings, is it depends on which ones you get. So my Rosa and Tata are actually paired equally, like a husband and a wife kind of concept. So if you were to get marked, the one that walks in front of you is actually like an aspect or an extension of you. While the one behind you is like your spouse. So the reason why Pompadour is associated with a lot of gay men is because Pompadour is known to get very, very jealous of other women. So it could be very dangerous for a man to get initiated into Kumbanda and have a Pompadour if he wants to be with another woman because she will see herself as his wife. And she could get jealous and upset and say, I don't like her and I don't like her. And she could get between the relationship. Eshu, on the other hand, I don't know if Eshus are like this. My personal Eshu is not very jealous. But he also comes with that husband energy of knowing that he's always going to pre protect me. He does not like dealing with abusive men around me. He will get pissed off and he will get upset with any man around me who does not treat me as equal. He will get upset about it. He's actually had a history of him getting mad or getting upset with my spouse. I'm not going to get into that before. This is how it is. So if you ever get marked your Eshu and Pompadour, know that once you're with that Eshu or Pompadour, that is your partner for life. You cannot do undo the contract. It is you and it is him and it is her forever till the day you die. And that's how it is. And it's very like a romantic energy and very passionate and very close because they're in the crossroads area, they feel like they're actually there with you way more than a lot of other Orishas or Neturu. Because of a lot of other Orishas or Neturu are very ascended. So they feel like they're a little farther away spiritually. But because they're in the crossroads, they literally feel like they're there with you way more typically than other Orishas or Neturu. So... But there was one time I was actually laying in bed and I seen Tata Kaveda um, have his hands around my head. So I actually suffered a concussion a couple years ago from domestic violence, which is actually another reason why I'm sure Tata Kaveda adopted me was because I'm a victim of domestic violence from my previous relationship. And Tata Kaveda is known to protect women who are a victim of domestic violence. That way I know I would never be abused ever again. Ever again, Tata will never let me get abused again. Tata will kill somebody or mount me and throw a motherfucker against the wall before anybody could ever put their hands on me, before anybody could try to abuse me or come close to me ever again. I know he will protect me. And I appreciate and I love my Tata Caveta for that. I know I never have to worry about any man ever putting his hands on me or abusing me or getting away with mental control, manipulation, or emotional abuse ever, ever again. I know he got my back. He got me. I know he does. And I love him for that. I love him for that. And I love how Rosa Cavetta brings me that confidence that I need to know that I am that powerful woman and nobody can stop me. I am unstoppable as I walk with Pompadour. And I am unstoppable as I walk with Tata Cavetta. I'm trying to see where I'm going to go on next. When you're marked, you become an issue. Oh, yeah, I think I already mentioned that part already. So, um, your connection with your issue and Pompadour depends on which issue and Pompadour you get. They're all different. So, my relationship with my issue and Pompadour and my tightness I have with them are not going to be the same experience that you have with yours. Um, some are going to be real, real romantic. Some of them are going to be more playful. Some of them are going to be more temperamental than other ones. Some are, All of them are different, okay? Every single one is different. And they're all going, if you get associated with, with them, if you get marked, they're going to be for your best lifestyle and for your energy that's going to match your energy the most. Everyone's experience is different. So my experience is my experience that I had. It does not mean anybody else is going to go through this. Doesn't mean my experience is wrong because still nobody else has been through it. Absolutely not. My experience is my experience. Everyone's experience is different. Somebody else who gets marked, marked their Eshu and Pompadour is going to have a totally ex different experience as mine. One thing that I have an issue with some of these practices is people cannot see past their self. They think, well, if my experience is like this and everybody else's experience has to be like mine. No, 
Your experience is your experience. My experience is my experience. Neither is wrong. Neither is better than the other one. Okay? Everyone's experience is different. This is how I experience my issue in Pompadour. This is how my Pompadour and my issue decide to manifest herself in my life. This is how my Pompadour communicates with me. This is how my Tata Caveta communicates with me. This is how my issue communicates with me. Does it mean that because you didn't experience this that I'm wrong? No. Does it mean if you don't experience this that means you're wrong? No. It just means this is different. That's just how it is. Everybody's experience is different. That's like one person's experience being initiated into Oshun and the way her Oshun experience uh, talks to her, it's going to be totally different than the way the next person down the road has their experience with being initiated into Oshun, for example. Okay, everyone's experience is different. And we need to understand that. We need to stop putting everybody in a box and thinking like everybody's experience has to be just like this and only this. And if it's not like this, then fuck you. That's stupid. Okay, and it's ignorant. And we need to get out of that shit. And when we think that way, we become dogmatic. This is why I got involved in Kumbana because I like to be free from dogma. That is dogma to think that only you could only experience this and it has to be just like this and everybody else has to experience everything only you experience. That's stupid and that means that you are one-sided and if you think this way, it means that you think the world and the universe revolves around you and that is egotistical and prideful. And absolutely against everything that I just said and how Pompadour and Eshu teaches us to get out of that mindset, to stop thinking like that. They teach us the hard way. If you want to be dogmatic and one-sided, Eshu and Pompadour will teach you the hard way. This is why we have losses. This is why we have issues in life and hiccups and problems because we don't want to get out of that mindset. So if you have a lot of issues in your life, if you have a lot of sickness and diseases and you have a lot of losses and going on and stuff like that, it's because there's something in you that you need to get out of. There's a reality in yourself that you need to free yourself from. A delusion is basically what it is. And this is why we practice Arisha work. This is why we do Kumbana. This is why we do Paulo. This is why we do Kemeticism. This is why we do this so we can learn to be better people. We could learn to be the best versions of ourselves so we could see beyond our own delusions and learn about the universe and learn about ourself in the universe and everything beyond that. If you're doing this because you want to worship, you're not doing it right. You're still Christian minded and you're still dog, you're still suffering from dogma and you're still suffering colonialism. If you actually think you're doing this to worship. It's not about worshiping. It's about learning how we are connected to these forces of nature, not only within us, and the, but the power that they have outside of us and how we are an aspect of those forces of nature all together. As above, so below. As within, so without. Out, as our soul, so the universe. This is why we learn to work with these beings so we can have a higher understanding of these forces of nature that live within us and outside of us. But please, like I said earlier, please, if you want to practice Kumbanda and work with Eshu and Pampajira, I notice a lot of people do this. Do not use Pampajira or Eshu as an excuse to practice bad character. Because remember, Eshu is a trickster. If you beg Eshu to jump off the bridge with you, he will. Because he's a trickster. So you be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you wish for. Okay? Because if you do not practice good character, your ego will tell you, oh, well, I could just feed Eshu and everything will be fine. <laughs> That's what he wants you to think. Until he teaches you the hard way and you hit a brick wall and you realize your life fell apart because you thought you were beyond karma and dharma. You thought you were bigger and better than the Arishas. When you think you could you can control the Arishas more than the Arishas can control their self, can control you, that is when you lost your point in the universe. That is where you need to learn to humble yourself. Because Eshu is a trickster. And he will trick you into thinking that you are bigger and better than all the Arishas. And as soon as you believe that, Eshu will teach you the hard way. Do not use Pompadura and Eshu as an excuse to not practice good character. Because all the curses you sent onto other peoples when it was unjustified by the voice of God will return back on you. And Eshu 
will make sure that it does. So that being said, if you want to be associated with Kumbanda, if you want to find out if you get marked your issue in Pompajira, if you want to find out if an issue of Pompajira walks with you, go ahead and message me and I will forward you my Torero so you could get your reading done and find out who yours is. My next video I'm going to be making is going to be on fallacies. A fallacy is reasoning reasoning that is logically incorrect. Like, for example, the person earlier who tried to um, mislabel me as a fraud. It's called a fallacy. It's called logically incorrect fallacy, okay? It's an argumentative, manipulative technique used to distract from the truth. It's a distraction from the truth. That's what a fallacy is. If you like that kind of stuff and you want to watch that in my next video next week, subscribe to my YouTube channel at Mind of Row. And don't forget to hit that notification bell so you can be notified whenever I have more enlightenment to share with you. I hope everyone is having a balanced white and right hand, left hand balanced day. Ankh Uchisaneb, Odabo. Peace.